This was a war between capitalism and socialism. We were only their tools, their weapons. Unfortunately, all the mistakes made at that time are being repeated today by the United States and NATO. It's the same mistakes made all over again. Zalmay Wieser was a general in the Afghan army heading the communist state's elite fighting units. Fighting together with the Soviet occupation force for years, Zalmay believed in the communist pledge of equality for all in his poor nation. When the Soviet Union pulled out of Afghanistan on February 15, 1989, Wieser, along with thousands of other Afghan communists, had no other choice but to leave Afghanistan for Russia. Today he has no citizenship and lives in Moscow trying to make a living as a jewellery salesman. Is this uh, NATO? Russia doesn't have laws granting us status as refugees. We have no status here, no passport and no official documents. Without these, we can't legally work, get an education or rent an apartment here. That makes life very difficult for us and it's very expensive. Not without a certain bitterness, Zami Wieser today reflects upon the choices he has made which landed him on the wrong side of the war. I just exist here. I don't feel like I'm really living at all. It's a late Monday evening and a group of middle-aged men get together to play ice hockey. They're veterans of the Afghanistan war. Many of them were badly injured in the campaign, a fact that their own government would prefer to forget about. The camaraderie and shared memories are all they have left. <laughs> it's impossible to forget what we went through. It'll stay in our hearts forever. We've been through fire and water together, and of that we're very proud. Sergei Sokolov was a fighter pilot in Afghanistan. In his Su-17 bomber, he accomplished more than 100 missions against an enemy he never met face to face. I always felt that we were in fact fighting against the West, the United States. The Afghans were receiving the money and the weapons to fight us from abroad. It wasn't the Afghan people who were the enemy, but America. In April 1984, Sergei experienced a dramatic turning point in his life. On his 120th mission, he became one of the first Soviet pilots to become the victim of the weapon many think decided the outcome of the war. The American Stinger missile. I remember seeing something that looked like a small cloud of smoke on the ground, down to my left. This was probably the exhaust of the missile. It most definitely was a stinger because they have the signature characteristic of white exhaust smoke. When the missile hit, Sergei lost control of his aircraft and saw the ground rapidly closing in. He knew the end was near. I glanced at my altimeter and I knew I was already too low to eject. Nevertheless, I decided to try and bail out. I landed in a dried out riverbed and that saved my life. Unhurt but badly bruised, Sergei noticed a large group of guerrilla soldiers coming down from the mountain to inspect the remains of his plane. What I feared most was being captured alive. They routinely kill their prisoners of war. At best, they would exchange the dead bodies afterwards. 
I counted around 60 soldiers closing in on my position. Suddenly one of them noticed me and pointed in my direction. They all took out their machine guns hidden underneath their robes and the battle began. A really tough battle. Armed with just a submachine gun and a few hand grenades, the airman stood his ground for an hour. Then he ran out of ammunition. Sergei realized the battle was lost. At this point I'd been wounded. I didn't realize how seriously until I noticed that I was losing my strength. I'd lost a lot of blood and was starting to see unclearly. The last thing Sergei remembered was a very familiar engine sound. Two Russian helicopters swept in low from the mountains. The rescuers managed to scatter the fighters and lift the badly injured pilot to safety. The next few years Sergei spent in hospitals, paralyzed in both legs and suffering from internal gunshot wounds. The first year I went through five successive operations, one after another. When I was released from hospital, I weighed only 46 kilograms. Due to his tremendous willpower, Sergei eventually managed to walk again. He also regained his pilot's license. Today he's proud of the job he did, but disappointed that he never got the chance to finish it. We also did a lot of good things in Afghanistan. Therefore, I don't want to call the war a defeat. It wasn't a victory, but we lived through it, and we learned our lesson. Unfortunately for them, the Americans who pulled us into this war never learned a thing. Now they are in Afghanistan, and they're much worse off than we ever were. Almost 15,000 Soviet soldiers were killed in Afghanistan from 1979 to 1989. The military defeat was so devastating that it played a crucial role in the dissolution of the communist state two years later. But in today's Russia, the memorials are few and far between. Only recently has the government decided to fund the only Russian museum dedicated to the Afghan war. The museum is very modest because when the war ended, the Soviet Union was disintegrating. We had to pull out of the war and the government wasn't very interested in paying remembrance to this. We who served in Afghanistan had to build the museum for ourselves. Do you think that today's government also wants to forget about this war? It may well be that it wants to forget, but it can't, because the war in Afghanistan still goes on. Our biggest political mistake was that we went there with the intention of making Afghanistan into something like the Soviet Union. The very idea to transform this society overnight wasn't just impossible, it was stupidity. As the number of killed and injured soldiers increased, the Soviet government increased its propaganda in an effort to dupe the population into believing that their cause was justified. I never understood what they meant with the term international duty. Still, everybody kept repeating this expression like parrots. In 1980, Vladimir Fadeyev had a career hosting his own radio program on Soviet national radio. However, Vladimir seemingly had one flaw. He loved jazz music. The Soviet director of public broadcasting didn't share this love and thought the music was harmful to young listeners. The director wanted him out of the way. He said, get your stuff organized and packed. You're making too much of a racket here. We're sending you to Afghanistan. And so I ended up in Afghanistan. As a Soviet TV and radio correspondent, Vladimir had severe restrictions on what he could say and show. Russian losses, for instance, could only be mentioned on the air once a week. 
И мы рассказывали о том, что где-то вот в Кишлаке открылась школа там, так сказать, да. We made stories about the building of new schools in villages, about our soldiers constructing irrigation plants for the farmers. Of course, this got pretty boring after a while. I don't think our viewers and readers ever got the full picture of what was happening there and why it took so much time. The reality on the ground was completely different than what the television viewers back home got to see. Just like today, Russian and Afghan civilians were under constant threat of attack from guerrilla fighters. Terrorist bombings, assassinations and kidnappings were commonplace, even in the well-defended capital. During the day, the Afghan government forces controlled the cities with our help. But as soon as the sun set, the resistance ruled the world. We called them the Dushmans. It's an Afghan word which means enemy. Just like today, the Soviet leadership was trying to put an end to the terrorist attacks by winning the Afghans' hearts and minds. Thousands of Soviet aid workers, teachers and engineers were mobilized to go there and help the Afghans rebuild their country. Teacher Natalia Batrakova was tempted by the opportunity to make some real money. Uh, yeah. To me, the international solidarity aspect was of no importance. My reasons for going there were purely economic. I had to make more money to support my mother and my small son, so I applied to go to Afghanistan, literally with tears in my eyes. Natalia and Vladimir met and fell in love in the besieged Soviet compound in Kabul. He had blue eyes, and he was very attractive, but he was quite poorly dressed. I'm a fairly good dancer and a talker as well. I tried to put my hand on the soft spot between her shoulder blades. When she didn't pull away, I knew that I had her. During their journeys through the war-torn Afghanistan, the couple constantly found themselves in dangerous situations. Before a trip to the north of the country, terrorists had planted a bomb in Vladimir's aeroplane. Just before takeoff, the door of the aircraft suddenly opened and a group of Afghan soldiers barged in with a mine detector. They searched the whole cabin. Suddenly they pull out a big box from under the seat of my cameraman. The box was dragged outside and it turned out that it was a powerful bomb with several kilos of explosives. In your plane? Yes, in our plane, with a timing device. We were supposed to blow up in mid-air. Natalia and Vladimir's passionate love affair eventually attracted the attention of Soviet authorities. They were accused of immorality and spoiling the reputation of the Soviet occupation force and so sent home. The expulsion probably saved Natalia's life. Having returned to Moscow, she received a phone call from the director of the institute where she worked. She told me, it's a good thing that you're no longer here. Today there was an explosion in the classroom where you used to work. Someone had planted a bomb inside the heater. It was a good thing after all that I sent you home. Despite their overwhelming military force, the Soviets never managed to control more than 20% of Afghanistan. February 15, 1989, the last Soviet tank left the country. Thousands of Soviet mothers and fathers greeted the withdrawal with immense joy. I cried when I watched on TV how our boys were leaving, because so much blood had been shed in such a short time, so many young lives, and for what? Since the Americans weren't capable of learning anything from our bitter experience in Afghanistan, I say let them continue to sacrifice their young soldiers there. At the peak of the occupation, more than 110,000 Soviet soldiers were in Afghanistan. Russian military experts have estimated that they would have needed three times as many troops to seal off the border with Pakistan and destroy the supply routes of the Mujahideen. Today, NATO 
has a little over 50,000 troops in Afghanistan to fight a Taliban which just keeps getting stronger. Again, the illegal opium production is rising, and again the borders to the south have proven impossible to seal. According to new statistics, 15,000 Russians die every year from Afghan heroin. That's exactly how many Russian troops were killed during 10 years of fighting in Afghanistan. Many Russians today believe the mistakes of the 80s have now come back to haunt them. I'm certain that it was necessary for us to invade Afghanistan. I'm even more certain that it was wrong of us to leave because we never finished the job that we were there to do. The same mistakes are being made all over again. Again, they're trying to force the Afghans into another way of life. But the Afghans are living their lives, just as they were when they defeated us. I really believe that they deserve what they get. The West will never be able to get out of Afghanistan. It's impossible to defeat the Afghans. General Salme Wiza carefully follows the news coming out of his home country. The exile believes strongly that the West's mistakes in Afghanistan are ever more serious than the Soviet Union's mistakes. They don't care about our traditions. They treat people badly. They know nothing about our culture, and on top of that, they keep betraying their own allies. All the people who believed in them. Wiese still hopes that one day he will be forgiven for fighting with the Soviets and be welcomed back to Afghanistan. I love my country more than anything. For 20 years I've been living here in Moscow, hoping to be able to return to Afghanistan. In fact, I never wanted to leave in the first place. But today, the way I analyse the situation, it's gotten worse. And it will continue to get worse.